So welcome everyone. I, I, I'm Glenn Hawkins. I'm our Senior Director of Product Management here at Oracle. I run our Maximum Availability Architecture team as well as DataGuard and a bunch of other HA and DR technologies that you probably are promote, familiar with. Um, and today I'm going to focus on Converge Database, Converge Oracle Database, MAA, in the world of hybrid cloud and multi-cloud deployments. So long title to kind of cover it, um, but, but I think it'll be an interesting spin on MAA. Some of you may have heard about maximum availability architecture before. Um, we're gonna go ahead and tie it together with a lot of the other a lot of the other pushes that we've been going ahead and doing, a lot of the other things we've been talking about, like the Converge database, as well as hybrid. And I know a lot of you are stepping into the cloud in phases and hybrid cloud is part of that. So we wanna help you with that strategy. And as far as multi-cloud deployments, which are becoming more and more popular. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into it. And I'm gonna start with a history lesson. And I know most of you are going, oh no, a history lesson. But I, I think it'll make sense if we go ahead and kind of jump into it here. It, it kind of ties it together, the way, the way things work. And I've been around for a long time. And I, I remember when applications were built with just a single development platform, maybe it was C++, maybe it was Java, um, whatever that was, and had a singular data store, right? Even before that, we had mainframes. Um, and these things had different levels of complexity, but as far as the development platform, there's usually only one development platform and one database in there, right? Um, and the data store, the, usually the data itself was, was just singular in nature, with one type of data, usually pretty simplistic um, in the way it worked. Um, a lot of them were operational, well, TP platforms, there wasn't a lot of analytics going on initially, and those kind of built out over time as we started to talk about data warehouses. But even in those cases, a lot of times one application, one data source sitting underneath it. But, but things have really changed over time. You know, data's really exploded. Here at Oracle, we talk about the data explosion and, and how it's been built up. But it's not just the fact that the amount of data has exploded, but also the different types of data. Um, you know, we have document data, we have we have machine learning, we have graphical data coming in, we have spatial processing data, text searches, you know, open text, and we have to go ahead and pull this in. Um, uh, our app developers have to deal with all these types of different data that's coming in from different directions, right? Uh, blockchain has become very popular now. And it's not only just the data, but it's also the way we consume that data and the way applications. So not only has the has a data layer, our, our data exploded, but also that development platform has exploded as well in lots of different ways for the way we're consuming that data and building our applications with microservices, events, API driven, low code. Um, the data is distributed. We're pulling data from different SaaS applications. We're pulling them in. Um, we're building our services in different data centers and going ahead and integrating them together. There's lots of different things that are happening to go ahead and kind of build up an application today. And really, the landscape has changed. And the modern day applications are much more flexible. We can build them out and we can evolve them very quickly. That's, that's the point of doing it is to be able to consume that data, um, be able to build modern day applications, which have to consume so much more data, so many different types of data than before. And it's only natural, and like a lot of different needs um, in, in our high tech world, that specialists come out of the market. And so single purpose best of breed databases started being built, right? Document databases, blockchain, reporting, machine language, or all these different purposes, and they went ahead and built them out. Um, and they've been coming on the market. Lots of smaller vendors have been building these out. And, and each one of these databases have, have been great in the way they've gone ahead and they built a very convenient data model um, with a purpose to easily go ahead and adopt and be really accommodating to the developers that are building these applications that have to consume that particular type of data. Um, so it, it was built to be very, very natural from that perspective. But in many ways, that, that's kind of where that paradigm ended. So they built it, but just the way they came onto the market, the way the vendors focused on their own databases, um, meant that they were single purpose databases at the end of the day. And, and even a smaller app, as we look at it, you know, a small app may start with just a document database, maybe it's, maybe it's a document and a reporting database. Um, but the idea is, you have microservices, we have all those different technologies to go ahead and evolve the application. And the business requirements change. And next thing you know, I'm a developer and I have to go ahead and, and pull in machine language. I have, I have graphic data. I have to go in and pull in different types of document data. I have to pull them in from different sources. Um, and that means I have to introduce new single purpose databases because my original ones don't accommodate that. Um, so I, I go ahead and pull them in. Um, and at the same time, my very easy API is still easy for each one of these and very convenient 
Uh, but now I'm dealing with four different types and I'm going ahead and, and it's all fragmented across these different, these different single process databases, um, different format. It's not really built to go ahead and kind of join together and it becomes challenging, right? So now my, my code looks the same way. My development platform, and I may have gone ahead and introduced additional development platforms trying to deal with the situation as well. Um, but each one of those are locked into specific APIs. All those convenient APIs, they're convenient, but they're different. Um, and the way they look at the data is quite different a lot of times as well. Um, so it, it locks the app into each one of these single purpose databases at the end of the day to go ahead and kind of build them out. And that data is now fragmented across it. So the natural technique, we go, well, that's fine. I can deal with that situation. I'm a developer at the end of the day. Well, let me go ahead and see how I can go ahead and integrate it. So let's, I can go ahead and do an application level data integration, try to pull in the application layer from each one of these data sources. There's solutions out there to go ahead and build that type of data integration. There's the old tried and true ETL replication that I can go ahead and build out um, and build kind of events, RPC on top as well, to go ahead and try to tie it together. However, each one of these, um, to deal with this data divergence um, that is unavoidable, introduces a lot of complexity. Now we have our single, our single purpose databases. We have all our development platforms. And now we have the ETL and the events. Um, I have to worry about that platform as well. So I have to run my ETL. I have to build out my ETL. Um, and I have to maintain and, and monitor all those type of systems too. So now it brings a whole different level in, into it. And our developers, our administrators, and everybody are, are, are dealing with all this, right? Um, so instead of going ahead and focusing on the next innovation, building out the next application, uh, I get another business requirement. They need to pull in another form of data to evolve it further. But I'm already dealing with all this ETL and everything. Things have become very complex in the way I have to deal with it. And I, I know uh, my developers no longer really have the time to innovate like they used to when I first started building it. They don't have the time as they used to because they're focused on that fragmentation and integrating it together. Um, in addition, each one of these data stores and the ETL and all these other pieces have their own specialized skills that I brought in to go ahead and deal with it. Each one has a unique management associated with it. So now I have you know, maybe administrators that go ahead and focus on each one of these in addition to the developers that specialize in it and our ETL and all the other pieces to go ahead and make it work. Um, in addition, um, you know, each one of these guys usually have their own different security, high availability, disaster recovery paradigms right, um, tied to this. Or worse, they don't have any disaster recovery and they're trying to use storage replication across there, which, as we know, copies over everything, including a, delete a file from the system and it copies it into my disaster recovery as well. So, so this is problematic. It means they don't have any DR paradigm associated. So they're different. Um, they're fragmented, the security is trying to go ahead and tie it all together, and we're trying, they're trying to create a design. Um, so in addition to the data integration of data fragmentation, I'm dealing with all the fragmentation from that perspective as well. So each one of these guys has their own security, own high availability. They're all built into their own silos. Um, the result usually is um, anytime I have a maintenance activity, anytime I have a, a, a worsen disaster, we're talking about prolonged recovery, right? Uh, it may take a long time to go ahead and get back up and run again. The downtime may be pretty significant, or I may have to take down large downtime during even maintenance windows to deal with that situation. Um, and, and in addition to that, I may have data loss associated with, depending upon what the system is, particularly if it has no disaster recovery solution that's dealing with storage replication. Um, I may not be able to recover that data store. It may be gone. And that may, I may just have to deal with that. Um, try to recover from backup and hope that I, I did a backup um, fully enough to go ahead and recover from that. So how can I deal with that level of fragmentation? What, what is the best approach, right? And you know, at, at Oracle, we, we believe there is an easier way at the end of the day. So uh, you know, we, we built on a singular platform. It, the idea is to create synergetic data technologies that work together. So can we go, can we pull it all together? We ask the question, we see all these single purpose database out there. Is it possible that we can pull all those together and, and tie it in with our very reliable Oracle database? So we want to eliminate the data fragmentation. We want to converge all those data types, all those different workloads into and accommodate them in a converged database and provide them in an easy to use API that, that's very straightforward that would accommodate all those different types so we don't have to have a different API, a different solution for each one, each one of those. And the idea is to help, help database administrators 
ensure basically we have all our high availability and ensure we're going to help in those developers so the developers aren't losing all the benefits that they got from a single purpose. So how do we do that at the end of the day? Well, there's our Oracle database, 19C. So let's go with 19C for now. Um, in, in, in the center there, and, and you know, it has, has everything built around it, right? Integrated into the solution. We have security. It's well known. I mean, the Oracle database is being utilized uh, by a lot of the most secure parts of the industry in the world, right? Whether those be governments, banks, financial institutions. Well known for security, well known for performance. So the Oracle database is, is known for its very strong performance. It's scalability. And the other one, I want to emphasize multi-tenant because we're not telling you to go back to a monolithic. We're not telling you to go back in history and use that monolithic single data store. No, no. We're saying the database is built on with multi-tenancy. It's, it's a multi-tenant platform. So you can have individual PDBs. You still get that level of isolation. We're not going back to that monolithic application, um, but we're going ahead and utilizing containers and portable databases on top of those. Obviously, it's much easier to manage. So manageability is a core part of it. It's something that we've always focused on at Oracle, and we're well known for going ahead and making it manageable, right? Um, and trying to reduce that complexity. And then, because you're you have the maximum availability architecture guy sitting in front of you, I'm going to emphasize this one: high availability and the application continuity, which of course I make as the biggest circle on the outside, right? Because it, this is this is kind of core, right? Disaster recovery, high availability, having those available to us. Um, and these are the things that cause a lot of pain, right? So, you know, security problems, availability problems, they, they make headlines at the end of the day. So we have all those, they're built into there, they're part of the Oracle database. Um, they're tried and true. A lot of these capabilities have evolved over decades to be where they are today. And they're well known, they're very reliable, they're used by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe applications out there. Now, as far as workloads go, we can accommodate all the different types of workloads. So, you know, data science, all the analytics, the transactions, internet of things, this is what we've been focused on is going ahead and dealing with all these different workloads. Because we want your developers to have everything that they have with a single purpose databases and be able to utilize them here. Likewise, all the different data types, so spatial data, graph data, blockchain, JSON, um, all these types of data, all these types of workloads as they come in, all these paradigms, and we want them all to be consumed. So, you know, whether they're going ahead and you have, you're doing graph analysis algorithms, you have spatial operators and functions, you have machine learning. A lot of times, it's not just one thing. A lot of times, uh, applications start with specialized capabilities. Maybe you start with kind of doing the app development and you have just two of these guys in there. Maybe you're doing some JSON. And then later, um, you know, for, for various security reasons, you want to get the ledgers in there and start doing blockchain. Internet of Things comes in. You want to do more analytics. And I guarantee everybody's going ahead and adding more analytics. That's always the direction goes. And each one of these types of data is exploding as well. So that scalability, that performance, um, the high availability, it's, it's all critical. And as your application is around longer, a lot of times it needs to be up 24 by 7. It becomes even more important. So the first day was the idea is to do more, do more with less, right? We, we don't want you to have to have uh, ETL specialists around as well as specialized um, DBAs and developers focused on each one of those platforms. We want a unified approach, pull it together. We don't want the data fragmentation. We want you to be able to go ahead and do it. And the idea is to shorten the time to value. So they don't have to focus on all that type of stuff. They can go ahead and build out the next version and continue to innovate on top of a platform that they're confident in. And we modernize workloads. We're constantly, and, and this isn't the end, the different data types that you've seen, the different type of workloads, there's going to be more. There's going to be more out there. We're going to keep on going ahead adding more. Data is going to keep on exploding as well as the data types. And, and we focus on that here at Oracle. In addition to the different platforms out there. So, so you can go ahead and utilize it. You have, a lot of you are on-premises, on commodity hardware. Maybe you started moving to exited engineered systems to get all those scalability and those performance, those specialized benefits associated with it. Um, and, and then you go ahead and you want to move to the cloud, right? Um, you maybe you're maybe you're using Oracle Cloud, maybe you're using Cloud at Customer. And, and we believe in going ahead and providing with the flexibility to do both. And then third-party clouds as well. They're in the picture. They're going ahead and pulling in VMware, right? And, and there's all lots of different platforms that are not listed in here. So the Oracle database can run in all of those, and, and it does today. 
So let's take a look at, at one, of our, one of our kind of highest level managed platforms, the autonomous data warehouse, and how that doesn't work. So it consumes all this data. We're pulling in all this different type of data, and, and it's, it's a data warehouse. It's built for analytics, right? So it needs all the data, type data types in there. So getting it into the system is critical. So we have built-in data acquisition built into it. So this is our autonomous data warehouse built in the cloud. Embedded analytics engines for all those different types of data, cube data, machine learning, graphs, documents, we have automated analytics and business models that are built on top of it. For those of you who played around with it, you know, you know what we're talking about. So everything that we built on premises, we built in the cloud, we automated it. And, and then of course, the infrastructure itself, all the high availability, the security, the performance, the scalability. So that's part of the architecture. That's what we've gone ahead and built. All those best practices that we've been building for years and rolling out and that Oracle is so well known for has now been automated on it. So you have all the converged database, all those different workloads, all those different data types, and you have all the infrastructure, a reliable infrastructure there, and a single data store, which is still multi-tenant in nature, so we still have the level of isolation that we, that we want as well. All right, so now, now we get into what I, my bread and butter, which is business continuity. We start talking about high availability, um, disaster recovery specifically, <clears throat> and how we do it here in Oracle and how it relates. I'm going to start with kind of terminology and talk about MAA, and then I'm going to jump in to some specific examples that we have out there. Um, and, and there should be some time. Hopefully, you're asking questions now. You can type in questions into the Q&A. If you're not already doing that, go ahead and do it. And I, I should have mentioned, um, with me is Siraj Ramesh, one of our product managers. He'll be answering those questions. It's part of my team that focuses on MAA. He'll be answering those questions in there. Hopefully, you guys are having good conversations with uh, Siraj on any questions you have that the things I'm going through. Uh, so I'm going to start with the terminology. And it's important that we kind of understand um, the way the way we talk about terminology and high availability. So we talk about high availability, those are redundant components, right? Those are clusters, all the different clustering mechanisms that we have in there. We have redundant hardware. If our if a computer, one of the servers fail, the servers will go ahead and pick up. It should be uninterrupted service. High availability from that perspective. Um, and these are both, when we talk about this, we're talking about it from both a planned maintenance standpoint and we're talking about it from a from a, a unexpected outage. Disaster recovery, that's our whole site going down. That's the way we see it. So you've lost a site, you've lost access to it. It's just not just one server, there's a power outage. Godzilla has just attacked your data center, it's down. Uh, so you need to go ahead and roll over. And you ideally, ideally are going to do that in uninterrupted and you're going to have zero data loss associated with it, at least for your most critical apps. Some apps may have some flexibility there. We'll talk about that in a moment. Everything should be scalable. And it, from a maintenance standpoint, we should be able to go ahead and do it in a rolling fashion. Whether we're talking updates, patching, upgrades, we have lots of different capabilities of that. Depending on what your need is for downtime, there's different approaches to each one of those that are built into what we talked about here um, in Oracle. And then as far as measuring, downtime and data loss. Those are usually measured in recovery point objective or RPO, measure your data loss. So that's, I, I can't recover my data, it's gone, the data has gone, it's caught fire. Um, how much data have I lost permanently, potentially? Um, a lot of you probably out there going, I, I, I can't afford to lose any, zero. I hope I've lost zero. Well, depending on what you've done um, and the way you've implemented it, you have flexibility in what you want on that level. Recovery time objective is the measurement of downtime. So now we're looking forward, our app's down. How long does it take before we start going ahead and our applications are back up and running? How long does it take to get our business back up and running? So that's RPO and RTO are kind of the measurement of that. And they're very important terminology to decide where you go and what type of approach you want to utilize. Now, maximum avail, Oracle maximum availability architecture. Is this, is this a software, is this a product that Oracle offers? No, it's a solution. And it's evolved over time. In fact, it's evolved over 20, 30 years working with customers just like yourselves over those years. The customer insights, expert recommendations came in, keep on making recommendations. Eventually, it evolved into a dedicated team. So a dedicated team of some of the most seasoned people at Oracle to be able to go ahead, go ahead and build those out. Um, they used a technique called chaos engineering, which I'll talk about here in a moment to go ahead and do that. Out of that, we have four different reference architectures, and we have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. We'll talk about those in a moment, and, and these are tiered, because it's not a one-size-fits-all. People have different RTO and RPO requirements. Now, into that, of course, we have different 
we have the different technologies. They all fall into continuous availability, data protection, active replication, scale out from a category perspective. And you see uh, all the different technologies that you know and love, like Active Data Guard, Golden Gate, Rack, Global Data Services, App Continuity, RMAN, they're all in there, right? They're all different, representing different parts. A lot of times, a lot of them actually go ahead and, and span multiple categories. Type there. And they're certainly all integrated together. And that's an important piece of this. It's an important part of right? So the Confer's database, integrated, H, uh, high, high availability will still provide all those capabilities, right? So all these features are, are part of it, but it's not, it's not just MAA by itself. And MAA is not a product. It's also the configuration and operational best practices. We have a bunch of different documentation. We have a site dedicated to this to provide you with reference blueprints to answer your questions on how to go ahead and implement it and follow those best practices. Um, and depending on your deployment choice, we, we've done some of this for you. If you're on generic systems, engineered systems, a lot of times you're following our guidelines. So the engineered systems definitely take care of some of this for you, like Exadata. As you get into our cloud, we start doing more for you with DBCS, XSCS, or Exadata Cloud a Customer. And finally, all the way to autonomous, where we have autonomous data guard, and we're going ahead and taking care of it literally in two clicks. Um, you set up a standby and a disaster recovery database. So li literally two clicks in our, in our autonomous database share. So the, the, of all the deployment choices, all the different paradigms, and you need to go ahead and decide, well, where do my, where do my application fit in there? And, and sometimes it evolves over time, right? And these are just kind of uh, ideas, right, for bronze would be normally maybe dev test and lower level prod, maybe internal applications. You just have a single instance running, it's restartable. We're doing backup and restores, right, at the bronze level. We we'll work our way up to you know, high availability, which is silver, right? And we start talking about clustering, rack. Gold is where we disaster recovery comes in. I would say the majority of our customers that are going ahead and using the product um, get to gold at some point because they want that disaster recovery. Um, either, either you know, they started with it and they started from the beginning, or you know, they realized it over time through some pain if they had an outage that this is something that's really required and that they really want for the application. And then for the highest level, I can't have, I have to have zero RTO, zero RPO is our platinum, right? So that can be leaked. That's what you see. And notice you always see like bronze plus, silver plus, gold plus. These are all hierarchical in the way they build. And a lot of times your application may start bronze or silver. And then as requirements go forward, you may go ahead and build a gold and platinum. And the best news is that they're hierarchical, right? So at, by going ahead and building out the bronze, you're all ready to uptake the silver. And likewise with the gold, everything builds on one another to go ahead and build it. So it's not just the technology as I mentioned, it's kind of the best practices. And I'll talk about those, you know, fast start failover, multiple standby, you need to think about it. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this. Before we jump into specific examples of start time of hybrid and multi-cloud and some of the other pieces, it's important to understand where we're coming from. And I have very, maybe slightly oversimplified diagram up there in the upper right corner, right? We have our single instance database, we have a local backup. And here, you know, we're not just going ahead and have a local backup because we're, we're the MAA guys. We wanna ensure that you have some type of replicated backups as well, ideally, in some isolated environment. We say second availability domain, which could be a nearby data center, ideally a separate data center associated with it. Um, our man's are kind of at the core of this from a backup standpoint, although you have options. You have a recovery appliance as well, which I'll talk about. ASM, online maintenance, flashback. These are unique technologies underneath the Oracle umbrella. And we don't even talk about them that much, but online maintenance, flashback, being able to flashback the entire database, rewind button, or just a single table, or just a bunch of queries. This is unique that you can do this. You don't even have to recover from backup to go ahead and undo a mistake that somebody deleted some rows or, or something like that happened. We can accommodate that just for the table here at Oracle or group a table for the transactions. Um, so we think about unplanned outages, we look at planned maintenance here. So you can see both those represent our outage matrix. So if, if a node goes out, okay, so it's just minutes to hours, we can go ahead and recover that. Um, a disaster is a bigger issue. So data center, big power outage, um, fire took place, get out, okay. so. We might have to recover from the last backup at that point. So we may have had some data loss associated with that whenever we took the last backup. Um, as far as recovery time, we're going ahead and running and running um, recovery from our map, depending on what we've gone ahead and done. Um, now keep in mind, if you're using a recovery appliance, it could still be zero. And recovery appliances use data guard under the covers, actually active data guard under the covers um, is included with it to go ahead and kind of provide 
what, what it does out of the box. So it's an appliance that goes ahead and gives you zero RPO. From a plant maintenance perspective, um, we don't have clustering in there. So we're going in and taking some downtime associated with it. Maybe those are minutes, maybe some hours, depending on what you've gone ahead and done. If you're using Exadata, it can be gone ahead and be significantly reduced associated with it. Although usually Exadata, you're always running rack at the end of the day anyway. So you're automatically kind of starting at silver. And the major upgrades, um, you know, whether you're trying to do an in-place upgrade or an out-of-place upgrade, a lot of people do out-of-place these days. Um, you have a time minutes to a to an hour, depending on what they're going ahead and doing from an upgrade perspective. Now, this is for the database, of course, the application as a whole and bringing down the application layer goes ahead and some of these time frames that you're looking at, you go, wow, mine are longer. It's because a lot of times you're thinking about the application layer as well. And so we accommodate a lot of that in our silver. So our rack database, which I've kindly gone ahead and replaced here with a with an Exadata system to give you kind of an idea, but it could just be an on-premise commodity hardware as well, is where the kind of the rubber meets the road of high availability. Um, um, it, it's where things start becoming easier for your application as well from a connectivity standpoint. Not that you couldn't do some of that, think about application connectivity, your application client, reconnecting on the bronze tier as well, because, but it becomes easier in the silver because of the application continuity feature that we've built in. Uh, and it's been optimized, especially up to 19C where we have transparent application continuity. Um, so we've gone ahead and we can see our recovery node time has gone ahead and been reduced down to seconds at this point. So it just fails over. But in reality, that can be even much less because of the app continuity feature. And it is a feature, it's built into Rack. So it's built into the database. And app continuity to take advantage of it. It's just a matter of using the right connection URL, making sure you're on the latest driver. We support a whole bunch of different language platforms associated with it, but it protects your in-flight transactions. So those applications that we're connecting up to it and you have your outage, um, and a lot of times you had to bounce some and all kinds of different things to get them to reconnect. Well, guess what? And your app developers also had to go ahead and maybe build um, some type of failure to deal with errors coming back to the app layer or worse, they would see that surface up, those, those transactions that actually fail. None of that happens with app continuity. Um, it will just be a brownout. It will fail over to the next rack node, and it will replay those transactions. And it's built in, that's functionality that's built into the database. Um, you're just going ahead and integrating it with the correct drivers and the caching error. You do not need to make changes to your application, though, um, to go ahead and deal with any APIs. We used to have that with transaction guard, no longer the case with application continuity. Um, so likewise, our plan maintenance now from, if you're going in applying patches, we can do so in a rolling fashion um, on our different rack nodes and roll through them, upgrading them to go ahead and provide, um, keep, keep the applicate or keep everything up and running and app continuity will take care of our failover there. Although if we have a lot of bulk transactions going on, we may want to go ahead and stop that workload just so we're not hitting our application continuity our timeouts associated with that. Um, so there's some things to think about. All that's covered in the application, the checklist in our diagrams there, you can see it linked in there. And yes, I'm sure you're already asking, am I gonna get this presentation later? And you will, and you'll see that link. You'll be able to go ahead and check it out. It'll walk you through how to take advantage of it. And many of you are not. I think about continuity is a missing link. Many of our customers want the functionality and they didn't realize it's there. Um, our major upgrade though is still minutes to hours as we go through. And that's all about to change here as we go ahead and jump into gold. So gold is where disaster recovery comes in, right? Um, and it's not just a matter of using active data guard. Well, I'm, I'm using active data guard, so I'm gold. Well, there, there are variations of that. And we, ha we, we, we are well aware that you have different data centers that sit out there and you're not able to accommodate having two regions we consider, right? Um, uh, you may not have two data centers sitting in each one of those regions. So you have to deal with the isolation differently the way it works. And we're using some of the terminology in our cloud, but the idea, is that you want you want significant geographical separation between your primary and your standby environments. That's very important here. You can see that represented in your diagram. And once again, it's very simplified because we would have availability domains on both sides of it. So we simplified that. We're only kind of showing those under the covers on one side. Um, so big question is, hey, you know what? Why do you have a, a you have a primary standby, then you have a local standby, and you have a remote standby? Well, why is that the case? Well, it's a distance. Right, those regions are geographically separated. Um, in, in the way data guard works, it's going ahead and doing replication across there. And if you do synchronous replication where it's waiting to so make the round trip and you need acknowledgements for the remote before transactions are committed on the primary, there's gonna be a big performance hit associated with that. A lot of people are going, well, that's too much of a performance hit. So how, how can I get my, how can I have my cake and eat it too? 
from a certain perspective? And the answer is a local standby, um, which will handle almost all the outages unless it impacts the entire region. So we, we like to say another availability domain, maybe a data center close by. If you don't have one, whatever level of isolation you have to set up a local standby. The synchronous replication, maybe our, our max protection mode would be set up there and it would be synchronous associated with that fast start failover automatically set up between there. Usually your application is running in there. Maybe you have two application stacks. Maybe you just have one and you're just failing over the database. If uh, for whatever reason, the whole data center fails, then you have your remote standby. And that's that's gone ahead and synced up usually asynchronously. Um, we do have the far sync technology. We have a bunch of technology that can be utilized to accommodate that. Um, but if you really want to go ahead and meet, if we look at our RTO and RPO metrics, and we're talking seconds to two minutes, you're going, wow, but I'm using Active Safeguard, and I don't, I'm not seeing that today. Well, a couple questions, right? You know, look at the best practices, and that's the key. This is why MAA is not just the technologies, but also the best practices, because you have fast drop failover. There's all kinds of other configuration optimizations that you can make on that front time of it. Um, and we have all kinds of tuning and everything that will help you get to where you want to be to go ahead and get to that time window. You also want to be using application continuity because application continuity works not just with Rack, but also with Active Data Guard. And it will go ahead and, and play, replay the in-flight transactions. Once again, those developers that we help someone with the Converge database, we want to help them here too. So that they don't have to create all this error handling to go ahead and deal with transactions, in-flight transactions failing. Um, we want to just go ahead and replay them, and we can do that here associated with that, right? So with our application continuity feature that's built into here as well, and we'll replay that. And there's lots of different parameters and everything that you can go ahead and set to deal with lag and all those types of things that you have to deal with. You don't want to get a false positive and have fast start failover, failover things accidentally. So you, you have control of that. We've added more knobs. We've added more tests. We have observer tests, validation for fast start failover. So you can go ahead and test these configurations without even going ahead and kicking over the failover. So lots of capabilities in there that we've been evolving. Some of those just came in with a 21C as we went ahead and rolled out. And finally, guys, that's the Platinum. So Platinum is, and, and I have a lot of people go, wow, you know, I just want zero RTO and zero RPO. That's my requirement. Well, that might be true, you know, but there's a lot of different ways to go in and get there. And that's one of the reasons we build these things out hierarchically. So you can go ahead and build up to that. Um, because once again, Platinum, we still have Active Data Guard in the picture, right? We have our standby, but now we have two primaries. Um, so with, with Platinum, we can go ahead and get you to that zero RTO and zero RPO. And we do so by having Golden Gate replication. They're having two primaries. If you're going ahead and you're doing any type of maintenance to one side, you have the other side and you can load balance. You get additional benefits by having active, active, having multi-master. Uh, you know, you might even have three out there with the Golden Gate replication um, to go ahead and accommodate that. Maybe you're using our, our global data services, our GDS for load balancing on that, but we still have active data guard in the picture as well. Why, why do we have that? Well, for those that are not familiar with Golden Gate and active data guard, they're very different technologies. Golden Gate's using logical replication. It's also asynchronous in nature. Um, which means, you know, it's not guaranteeing zero data loss. So we have active data guards set between those primaries and those local standbys. So we have those set up. We have backups happening off the standby. So active data guard, we can also do backups off the standbys, um, taking that load of having to take backups off the primaries as well, as well as many other things. Um, so we have the capability now to go ahead and do that. We have our synchronous replication happening between the primaries and the, stand, the local standbys. So we have our zero data loss on there. And then we have asynchronous replication happening there between the Golden Gate replication. If any of those primaries fail, it'll fall over to the standby and the Golden Gate replication will pick up against the standby to the remaining primary. Um, now, there's a couple things to think about though. And, and jumping into platinum has to be considered. Everybody wants zero RTO and zero RPO, but um, you have to think about active, active, or maybe you want active passive between those primaries. Because it's asynchronous in nature, um, which means you have to think about conflict resolution with Golden Gate. Um, it means that you know sequences. If you have an application that's using sequences, very simple. Most applications are utilizing them. Well, if, if Golden Gate's your replication and you have workload against those two primaries, you better think about that ahead of time. Usually, maybe just odd and even. We'll have one of the primaries, the one in, uh, in, over in Europe, will run odd, and our and our uh, North America will run even. That's why we're going to go ahead and do it. Um, so we can go ahead. There's lots of different ways we can deal with that. I could also go with active passive. 
and I'm just one load balancer flip away from going in and switching it. Or maybe I even want to go in and test it on a regular basis. Um, with GDS, I can also get geographical affinity. So I can go ahead and tie um, queries that are coming into one of those primaries, go to the closest primary, right? So I get additional scalability benefits as well. Um, I can also have master tables. Golden Gate is logical replication. So I could have a better master tables and then I could have um, and then I could have local ones. So although that might impact my high availability from perspective. But I have the point is that I have a lot of flexibility with Golden Gate. Um, we also have sharding and we have addition-based redefinition. Addition-based redefinition allows us to go to zero downtime application upgrades. So I, I probably don't have enough time to go into that in detail. Um, but we use our addition technology to go ahead and do that under the covers. Sharding is um, goes ahead and does essentially horizontal partitioning, where we can have each one, each shard is its own instance. And we're going ahead and splitting those up. So we have all the same columns across all those different shards, and the rows are different depending upon the sharding key. So then we have different paradigms in Platinum. We've created a very flexible architecture that you can take advantage of. Um, and, and you can do a mixture of these different technologies. Golden Gate isn't the only answer. You can just use the EBR and take advantage of that for a zero downtime application upgrades. We do that a lot in our own technologies. Our Fusion apps, our EBS um, are all going ahead and taking advantage of it. Essentially, anytime you hear the term zero downtime upgrade at Oracle, we're using, usually we're using EBR under the covers to go ahead and accomplish that. So we utilize that. We utilize sharding. There's lots of different pieces out there where we go ahead and, and you can find a, a great presentation on uh, how Blue Kai, one of our one of our acquisitions a few years back, is, is going to take advantage of sharding to get the scalability that they want. So lots of advantages to use these technologies. Um, but a lot of times we're talking about Golden Gate here as well on this front. And that's kind of our bread and butter. And then we have these two alternatives tied in with it as well. So this is the highest level. And they all build on top of each other. By all means, you can go ahead and get silver, gold, and then you can build up to platinum afterwards. You can introduce that. Now. How does this work and how can we go ahead and build it in a, in a cloud environment? Now, we always talk about everybody's going to the cloud. That's true. Everybody's going to the cloud. Um, and but a lot of times it's, it's specific. Maybe I'm doing my new develop, my new application in the cloud. My older applications are sitting on premises and I, I want to move them to the cloud, but I, I need to do so in a phase fashion. I'm not, I'm not just ready to do that. And we have a lot of capabilities like our zero downtime migration to help you with that, help you with that migration and set it up. Um, but one of the ways is you may be in a hybrid cloud fashion. And so in this case, hybrid cloud could mean a lot of different things. In this case, I'm talking about setting up a disaster recovery environment in the cloud or doing backups in the cloud. Kind of a natural way to go ahead and uptake it. And we have, we have technical papers that will walk you through how to set this up. Um, but it's all tied together. Essentially, if you want to go ahead, let's say you, you want to go ahead and you decided, I don't have a disaster recovery environment or my, uh, you know, I need to, we need to get rid of the data center that we're doing disaster recovery in. Um, let's go ahead and, and utilize Oracle, Oracle Cloud to go ahead and do that. So you take a backup of your, of your primary, push it up to the cloud. We create a physical standby from it and we're on maybe DBCS or maybe if I'm running on Exadata on the on-premises, I, I want to run an XSCS up on the cloud or maybe XSCC or cloud of customer. Maybe I'm going to roll in, um, I want to take advantage of the cloud, but I want to do so in my own data center. So I have all these different options available to go ahead and set it up. So, I set it up, I have my disaster recovery set up there. My active data guard configuration is operating across there. Um, I also have different options. I could go ahead and take advantage of Golden Gate, another option I can go ahead and utilize this. Um, a lot of our customers are using data guard to set it up. And our zero downtime migration feature, our ZDM, um, can give you a, a quick way to set this up because it actually does this. It will take the backup, it will stand up the physical standby, it will help you go ahead and kind of stand up very quickly. So you can go ahead and utilize that as a, a quick start so to speak. Um, and then we have the observer. And for those of you unfamiliar with, um, with data guard, I go, well, what was the observer for? The, the observer is how we do our fast start failover. So the standby is obviously available to the primary and can see if it goes down. Um, but we want a, a second look at that. So our observer goes ahead and provides that level of visibility to ensure um, that we're failing over correctly, we're automating that failover, and that we have more than one point that's going and looking at it. Um, so the observer usually sits at some level of isolation. We have it up there in what we call region three. It could be any anything, and we realize that sometimes you don't have another data center. You could you could go ahead and run it in one of our other availability domains in, in the Oracle Cloud. Um, you could run it. It's a very very small footprint. It can run anywhere, but it's another point that's going and looking at the primary, it's looking at the standby, it's aware of what's up and running, and it's in charge of ensuring that fast start failover works properly. 
another thing to kind of keep in mind. Uh, now, we don't necessarily just need to set up disaster recovery. We could be taking archives. We've taken a backup in the cloud as part of setting up DR. Well, we could go ahead and just use the backup. That could be our start. We could go ahead and just an archive up into the cloud um, to go ahead and free up our data center and our storage. So we have so many different options for going ahead and taking that step into the cloud. And I will tell you that many of our customers, um, we have a lot of different case studies out there, like a 7-Eleven, for example, has already started with hybrid and they worked their way up to full cloud. So hybrid was a stepping stone, they set up their disaster recovery, and later they moved their primary up into the cloud as well. So you have a lot of options. It's a great way to go ahead and kind of step your way into it. Now, all the different technologies and all the different MAA tiers, um, as far as high, as far as sources, you know, what can I do? What can I do in DBCS? Well, you know, DBCS I can set up, I can set up, um, I can set up bronze. Uh, and notice I put gold, I don't put silver. Why, why do I have silver there? You know, with rack. And it's because you've already set up Active Data Guard to go ahead and do the the push, right? To go ahead and configure it as part of the system. So by default, you have a gold environment as far as going and set that up. Now there's variations, the local standbys, and all the stuff we recommend. And that's why we always say there's we, we have to be flexible on the goals. We want you to have a local standby and a remote standby to give you that RPO that you want, but there's this flexibility and that's why we have a range on it. Um, so with DBCS, we can easily accommodate bronze, gold, Exadata Cloud. And usually um, if you're running Exadata on-premises, you want to use the Exadata Cloud or you want to use Exadata Cloud customer to go ahead and take advantage of it. Um, so these are obviously gold environments. By default, you have rack there already. Um, you could certainly go from an on-premises non-XData to XFCC or XFCS. You have that option to go ahead and do it. And that could be part of your strategy for going ahead and moving to the cloud and reaching um, the stage that you want to reach with your application architecture to take it to that next level. Um, but some of the exclusive features of XData, as far as that goes, it may, may not, you may not be able to go and take advantage of everything unless you're doing XData to XFCS, right? So you have options. Um, if you're an XFCC to XFCC, we consider that cloud a cloud. So that's not even a hybrid configuration. As far as that goes. And then autonomous. So autonomous, um, you can't set up Active Data Guard, uh, but we can set up Golden Gate. We support that today. Um, we plan on going ahead and expanding those capabilities, expanding those options in the future. But Golden Gate would be the way to go ahead and set this up today. And you have a single instance or you have Rack, you go ahead and set it up. And you can go to autonomous database shared or dedicated depending on what you want. Um, usually you want dedicated with Exadata, as far as that goes, single instance or rack, you may go to autonomous database shared, but there's no, there's no hard, fast rule on what you want to go ahead and do as far as that goes. And of course, the autonomous database can also run it at, um, we can run a cloud at customer too, right? So you can do autonomous database cloud at customer. So you have that option uh, on that front as well. And autonomous database runs in Exadata, so you're going to get all those advantages. Okay, so let's start talking about multi-cloud. Multi-cloud is different, right? Multi-cloud, we're not talking about disaster recovery. We're not talking about a database running in one, one place and running in, uh, and then running part of it in our cloud, right? What we're talking about usually in multi-cloud, and now there's different ways that, that you might be defining multi-cloud. What I'm defining here is the application tier, you've chosen to run the application tier somewhere else, right? In some other type of cloud. And you're, you want to take advantage of the Oracle database to get all the stuff we talked about with the Converge database, to get all the high availability, the security, all the benefits of the Oracle database. I want to take advantage of that, but I want the flexibility to run my app tier wherever I want to run it. So um, I can go ahead and do that. And, and we I brought our partner kind of into this diagram, Megaport, which goes ahead and provides that network redundancy as well. And I did a session um, with, with Megaport with Mike Rockwell not that long ago. Some of you may have seen that, but we talked about this. Um, so we have that kind of redundancy. You're running the app tier. You have the database running in there. You make your take advantage of DBCS, XFCS. Um, and this example is gold. So we have that gone ahead and set up. We have our local standbys. We have our remote standbys there between the two regions, region one and region two. And our app tier is connecting into that, right? And maybe our app tier is split. Maybe it's not. However, it's coming in there. I sort of have it on a monolithic, that pink box there kind of representing that. And that could be anything. That could be it could be a hybrid. You could be running that app tier on-premises. Um, you could be running it in one of the other third-party clouds, right? And we have other things to accommodate. Some of our data centers have Azure interconnect in some of those regions. So very fast connection, very fast connection between, between the app tier. So you can take advantage of this um, at, at the highest performance possible. 
Um, and then Megaforce providing that network redundancy as well. So you have that kind of built into the system. And, and this is just, it's not the only example, but it's one of the, one of the better examples that we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of customers take advantage of today to go ahead and get to this. How would we do platinum, right? So platinum, we have two different data centers in there, right? So two different data centers, two different app stacks sitting in two different regions. Um, you know, maybe one of those sitting in Europe, one of those sitting in North America or different different parts of North America, wherever, wherever it might be. Um, we have them coming in. We have Megaport in the picture. This is our kind of our part of our examples. These are Megaport enabled data centers. The app tiers are running there in this particular example. Um, we, we have our um, Oracle Hub gateway, which would normally be running somewhere in the in um, inside the Oracle cloud to go ahead and accommodate that piece. Um, we have Golden Gate replication happening between two different regions. Um, those two different pink blocks there are probably in the same region or pretty close to it to go ahead and lower the latency. Maybe they're going again using Azure interconnect again within those environments, um, and they're connecting up to those those two regions. And maybe I'm set up active active here. And I have some kind of regional affinity. Maybe I have all my workload from one region going to uh, my my uh, region in North America, and then all my European queries, all my workload from there going into uh, a European data center to go ahead and accommodate that. Um, but at any point, I could flip the load balancer and I could go ahead and switch it over, and I, I could throw everything over to the other region and have everything going to one. Um, whether I'm doing an upgrade, I'm doing any type of maintenance, or I have any kind of outage that's going to occur. So once again, active data guards in there providing local replication. We're getting zero RTO and zero RPO associated with this. Um, a couple things I want to point out. So the Golden Gate piece, the Golden Gate right now, you would go ahead and set up the Golden Gate hub. Um, needs to be configured manually. That's really important because the hub itself, you want it to be high avail highly available too, to go ahead and set up. And we have a, a paper that tells you exactly how to do that. And that's what we use in our own cloud. Is Oracle going ahead and going to accommodate automation around that in the future? Of course. You know, that's, that's what we usually do, right? If, if somewhere um, that we're going to go ahead and roll it out, we saw the Golden Gate Cloud Service has already been rolled out, and we're always evolving. And you tell with autonomous data garden pieces, it's, it's constantly, we're adding more automation all the time. That's our focus, right? Is to take all these technologies, proven technologies, and to add automation. And we do so at a pace that we feel that we, we can go ahead, we want to harden everything for you before you guys start using it. So we're going ahead and rolling it out. But right now, the Golden Gate Hub will be set up following our best practices associated with it that in HA, set up the hub in HA as well. So it has redundancy. Um, uh, and, and as far as the multi-cloud, same thing with the, with the hybrid cloud. Um, there, you're not using our control plane to set up because part of it's on-premise, part of it's another third cloud, third-party cloud. So you're using it to set, set up the different pieces. So the Golden Gate piece happening through the control plane. But um, the standby environments, as far as going and configuring um, um, data guards, obviously you you have that ability. So we have the ability to go ahead and do do this with a mixture of uh, manual configuration, be able to crack the hood, and we allow you to crack the hood on the XSCS, XSCC, DBCS to go ahead and accommodate these different pieces. Now, how does the MA team ensure? This how do how do we do the availability and performance scalability and what what is that I mentioned forty plus individuals what what technique do they use so the answer is that we use something called chaos engineering essentially we're we're breaking things to ensure your peace of mind we're we're breaking things ahead of time um, this team has the the fun job of actually going ahead and 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 causing things whether they're likely or unlikely on a combination of events that might happen simultaneously. Um, and when they happen, they're catastrophic. We, we ensure that they happen on a regular basis in our testing center to ensure that our failover, our high availability works properly. We put our systems through very turbulent events to go ahead and do so. And these are practices that you can employ in your own data center as well to go ahead and test out the environment. You get the app stack, you get, uh, get the you, you can go ahead and build it up. The idea is to go ahead, and it really is an art form at the end of the day. Um, and we this, this MA team goes ahead and works day and night on to make our harden our products as well as to harden our best practices and make them available to you and many of you have a, you know operated with us and worked with us in the past right um so we're constantly building we're evolving those out we have a bunch of resources at the end they'll bring you through the network failures human errors you know somebody's gone and deleted the table um whatever that might be to go ahead and l to prevail your uh, power failures and site failures, we'll pull the plugs out of walls, 
and, and we go ahead and test these environments to make sure they work in our cloud, on-premises, and Exadata. Um, so it's something that we focus on all the time, and it's a never-ending job. It never ends, right? Because everything is evolving. All those modern-day applications, new data types, new workloads, new technologies, new different environments, new multi-cloud strategies, um, it's a never-ending job to go ahead and kind of build those out. And thus, chaos engineering it, it is really, as I said, it's kind of an art form, and it's constantly just experiment. We have to keep on building them out, and we have to keep on going ahead and building out new use cases that tie in with them. So it's a very interesting technique that you may want to go ahead and kind of read up on. Um, so let me go ahead and summarize before we just open it up in questions here, open up to Q&A. So, so, you know, data-driven applications, synergetic data technology, um, and, and these, these siloed, single-purpose databases, they, they, they were created with a purpose to go ahead and accommodate the modern-day development methodologies, but they introduce a lot of complexity, a lot of things that make it very difficult for the application to evolve as data becomes fragmented in the single-purpose databases, as well as ETL and everything to keep that application working starts to become a distraction and your team will find itself only doing that over time and probably even having to add resources just to go ahead and accommodate that over time. So the converged database resolves all that by going ahead and allowing you to do all the data types, data models, different workloads, all works together, takes advantage of all security, high availability, scalability, without losing all that portability and isolation because it's built in a multi-tenant fashion. So we're not going back to monolithic. We can have our cake, and we can eat it too with a converged database. That's the answer. And of course, you know, it simplifies the development, the operation. So you're focused on the APIs, you're focused on one set of APIs, no longer focused on data fragmentation. We're focused on building out the next version of our application. And we know that any new data type or any new workload that our business requires in the future, converged database can deal with it. It can work with it. And if there's new ones coming out of the market, Oracle's gonna go ahead and add those too. We're gonna go and continue to evolve our system. We're not done. We'll never be done. And all the high available disaster recovery and security, right? And, and those three are, are critical, right? Performance and scalability, we always talk about that, but the other pieces are really high availability, fast recovery, and security. They're really all tied to business continuity. If any of those can very much upset our business, and once our business is down, it has an enormous impact overall. 